Howdy Star fans, Jack here for NSF with another Starbase update for you. This week, Starship's orbital test flight is seemingly just days away, while simultaneously feeling like it's at least a week or two away. All while Elon Musk is tweeting that Starship is ready to go, pending regulatory approval. So what the heck is going on? Well, for starters, as with the first launch of any rocket system, the final few weeks before a first launch is filled with delays and unknowns. But at least, this week we got the milestone of Ship 24 getting stacked back atop Booster 7, and hopefully that means that launch is, in fact, soon. So when should I, or anyone else wanting to witness this historic launch for that matter, pack their bags and head back to Starbase? Good question. We'll unpack that in this week's action-packed update. So let's jump right into it. Before SpaceX can launch this absolute unit of a rocket, they kind of need to do some cleaning around the launch site. After all, you don't want a bunch of FOD or foreign object debris strewn about that'll go flying when the thrust of 33 Raptor engines starts lifting Starship off the pad. That could damage things like the tank farm, the orbital launch mount, who knows what else. In last week's Starbase update, we talked about how SpaceX has indeed been cleaning off the orbital launch mount, or OLM, by removing scaffolding from the underside and inside of the mount itself. This week, the remaining scaffolding has been removed, along with a temporary handrail that's there for safety. I say temporary in air quotes because, well, it's been there for about two years, and I was starting to think that instead of being removed, it would just be sort of melted off while Starship lifted off the launch pad and 33 Raptor engines thrust just obliterated the OLM. At the beginning of the week, we saw SpaceX perform a proof test or propellant load test of some kind on Booster 7. For this test, the teams simulated an entire propellant load sequence for the booster, just as it would undergo on launch day. However, unlike the full wet dress rehearsal we saw done previously, this test was done with liquid nitrogen and liquid oxygen, rather than liquid methane and liquid oxygen. Why? Because liquid nitrogen is inert, and if anything goes wrong, you have not the same kind of boom that you would have with a whole entire cloud of liquid methane. Meanwhile, the liquid oxygen tank was indeed loaded with the real deal, as evidenced by the tons of venting coming from the liquid oxygen side of the tank farm. In case it isn't obvious, such huge amounts of highly flammable fuel would pose a serious blast danger to the surrounding buildings and people. If you remember, when they did that full wet dress rehearsal, they had to evacuate the village, and for this, they did not. One other interesting thing to mention here is that for this test, the chopsticks were raised and located hugging the booster, but technically not touching it, and even not under the load point. Why was this done? Your guess is as good as mine. Next up, on the list of seemingly obvious things to test before Starship's first launch, the ground tracking antennas that are used to relay telemetry from Starship back to Mission Control on the ground were tested. Nick already talked about this happening on last week's Starbase update, and I'm here to tell you that this week, it's still happening. You know what I always say, more data is more better. Also this week, we saw SpaceX move the Raptor work platform from the launch site back to the storage site near the village. This platform is used mostly to remove or install Raptors on boosters while they sit on the orbital launch mount. Most recently, it served as a temporary platform to help install the blast shields on the OLM. But now, with no engines to remove and no scaffolding needed, it's not needed anymore. So, it went back to storage. Of course, the highlight of this week was the stacking of Ship 24 back atop Booster 7 for pre-launch checkouts. However, things didn't exactly go smoothly. During the first lift attempt, a dangling cable could be seen from the aft of the ship. The lift was then aborted, and the ship lowered back to the ground. A team of workers was sent to the pad, they removed the dangling cable, and as soon as they had evacuated the area, the lift operation started once again. If you think that's where the problem stopped, you'd be wrong because this is where things got a little sketchy. As the chopsticks released the weight of the ship and it settled onto the booster, the whole stack flexed in a very, shall we say, sketchy way that frankly didn't look right at all. As evidence that something wasn't quite right, the ship was lifted once again to adjust its alignment. This flexing or swing may have been produced by an improper weight balance as Ship 24 settled on Booster 7 without the correct alignment. You could say that it was a very unsettling event. No, no, wait, it wasn't very uplifting. Let's go with that. A lot of people have asked us how they in fact joined ship and booster, and I figure this is as good a time as any to go over it. 
In order to join the two vehicles, the booster has three pins at its top. On this picture I took of Booster 10's forward section a few months back, you can see what the pins look like. The pin itself is made of two parts, a curved section that acts as a guide for the ship to settle into place, and a hook in the middle that hooks to the receiving interface at the bottom of the ship. As a reminder, this is not a separation mechanism. This is just what holds the full stack together. I guess you could call it a holding mechanism. Speaking of the full stack, while super exciting to see the vehicle stacked once again, this is likely not the last time this will happen before flight. We expect teams will need to destack Ship 24 from Booster 7, even if only for a few hours, just so they can set up the flight termination system. This will also involve pulling the safety pins to protect the system from being accidentally triggered while people are around. You know what also makes sense? Heading over to shop.nasaspaceflight.com and grabbing yourself a metal print. We've got all kinds of cool prints, not just of Starship's full stack, but also ship rollout, other rockets like Falcon 9 and Delta Heavy, and best of all, they're printed directly on metal. They don't need a frame, they come with everything you need to hang, and they look great. So head on over to shop.nasaspaceflight.com and check out our metal prints, or maybe buy yourself a Starship Orbital Test Flight patch. All right, let's get back into it. So why is SpaceX stacking Ship 24 atop Booster 7, if not for launch? Well, the truth here is, is there might be more testing that needs to occur ahead of such launch. Shortly after the stacking, SpaceX announced on Twitter that they're aiming to perform a, quote, launch rehearsal, something more commonly known in the spaceflight industry as a wet dress rehearsal, or WDR, as soon as next week. In that same tweet, the company also announced that the launch should follow about a week after pending regulatory approval. As of recording, road closures indicate that the first opportunity for this test would be April 11th, although things are obviously very fluid and could have changed by the time you see this. The backup dates for April 11th would be April 12th and April 13th, which is Wednesday and Thursday of the week. It's interesting to note that the road closure window times are different from the ones we're used to. These windows open at midnight central time and close at 2 p.m. central time. If you watched our recent video on the trajectory for Starship's orbital test flight, then you know all about the window times. And if you haven't watched it, then come on, go watch it. It's a great video. The launch window appears to be set for the early morning hours right after sunrise. So taking this into account and looking at the road closure window for the WDR, it seems like SpaceX will want to perform this test like a proper launch rehearsal, even to the point of preparing for it to occur inside that window, with the road closure beginning at 12 a.m. and condition it for propellant loading. During a wet dress rehearsal, the rocket and ground systems run down the whole entire countdown sequence, all the way to the point of engine ignition, but of course, without that happening. This test, unlike the one we saw on Booster 7 this past week, will most likely use actual liquid methane, so evacuations and notices should have popped up by the time you watch this video. If they haven't, then things are probably changing. Did I mention the situation is highly fluid? As of the recording of this video, it is set for no earlier than April 17th, pending regulatory approval. But of course, by the time you've watched this video, that could have changed. If you've been paying attention, you know that this last week has been a mess with launch dates. As you probably saw on our last Starbase update, Navigational warnings were sent out for boats to avoid entering the areas where rocket parts might be raining down on them if the launch fails. These notices were pointing to a launch between April 6th and April 12th, and rumors said the target was April 10th. This was later confirmed via an update to the FAA Operations Plan Advisory that showed the date as being the earliest one SpaceX was tracking for launch. This was further confirmed by NOTAMs for Mexican airspace to keep aircraft outside of the hazard zones. However, by this time it was becoming clear that such a date would not hold, and SpaceX's tweet was the last nail in the coffin. So when is Starship going to launch? Well, the current net date once again is April 17th, but that is heavily subject to change. Then why is Elon tweeting that Starship is ready to go? Are we waiting on the FAA? Is there more testing to be done? What's going on? Once again, it's really hard to say. But what I can say is that if you're wanting to watch this launch in person, Maybe wait to book your flights or hotel unless you can book something that you can get refunded or change without a fee. It will definitely become obvious as we get closer and closer to launch. Next up, once Ship 24 was stacked on Booster 7, teams went up to the quick disconnect arm to prepare the vehicle and ground interfaces for the mating of the umbilicals to the ship. This involved removing the protective caps on the ground umbilical quick disconnect and the protection cover on the vehicle quick disconnect plate. With covers removed, the quick disconnect umbilical was connected to the ship, and then minutes later, a quick retraction test was performed. It's important to test these interfaces because, as we've learned with SLS, a leaky quick disconnect plate is not ideal, to say the least. Another cool thing that happened this week was an addition to Booster 7's Plus Y stabilizer attach point. In case you're unaware, the chopsticks attach to the booster not just at the two points up near the grid fins, but also two points lower down in order to stabilize the vehicle as it's lifted or removed from the launch mount. What's going on with this addition to the stabilizer attach point? 
We don't know. Tell us what you think in the comments. All right, we've talked a lot about the launch site, but now let's move back over to the production site where the future of Starbase in the next two or three years is taking shape. This week, we've seen even more foundation work for the new building under construction at the site of the old scrapyard. It seems like teams are hard at work to complete these foundations and start building up the structure. Just next door from here at Remedios Avenue, Ship 26 sits on the Raptor installation stand. The ship has already received all of its six engines, and work is likely underway checking the interfaces between them and the ship, and perhaps even installing their engine shrouds. It might not be until after Starship's first launch that we see another ship perform a static fire at the pad, so it's always good to make sure that future vehicles are ready to go when they do in fact bring them down to the launch site for testing. If you've ever been to Starbase, or indeed anywhere in South Texas, you know it can be extremely humid. So the site of a new ventilation system on the high bay is no surprise. This week, we saw work ongoing on the back of the high bay to install that new air duct, likely to remove the pesky humidity that might be created inside of it. I can't imagine how hot it can get inside the high bay, especially with all the welding that's been going on in there. And I say that precisely because this week we saw Ship 28 now fully stacked and welded together inside the high bay. If you remember, Ship 27 was stacked just a month ago, and now it's Ship 28's turn. At this rate, we might as well see Ship 29 being stacked by next month. And we've seen a ton of parts for Ship 29, so that definitely could happen. Anyways, back to Ship 28. Unlike its predecessors, Ship 26 and Ship 27, Ship 28 sports a full set of thermal tiles and flaps, so it's likely going to attempt a re-entry just like Ship 24. Moving now from newborn ships to newborn boosters, Booster 11's liquid oxygen section was moved to the entrance of the mega bay so it could receive its methane transfer tube. This is a nominal part of booster stacking. A separate methane tank section should start to be stacked soon, and once each part is completed, both will come together to form the entire booster. With all these ships and boosters being built, where do you think the production line will stand at this point next year? Let us know what you think in the comments. All right, that's it for this video. Good luck to everyone who's hoping to catch Starship's orbital flight test in person. And of course, don't forget, be excellent to each other.